Welcome to a very special episode of Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. You heard correctly. Tonight's special episode is the Season 8 finale and your latest installment of Hometown Legends. Every town has a tale, every village a story, and tonight we hear legends from every corner of the U.S. and then some. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that I have a buttload of these stories. So let's get started. Kicking off the season eight finale and setting tonight's scene, we begin with Shane in the state of Washington. Here is his hometown legend. Hey Derek, my name's Shane. I'm calling you from Seattle. I left a message not too long ago, but I thought of another thing um, that not something I've ever directly experienced, but it's a, it's a cool story from Washington state that I'm sure many listeners have heard, but probably not all of them. It's called Mel's hole. Mel is a person who lives in uh, Ellensburg, Washington, lots of farms and still kind of in the foothills nearby. But there's a story of this allegedly bottomless hole on this guy Mel's property. Uh, apparently, he lowered a lot of weighted fishing fishing line into the hole to test how deep it was. And his story is that he lowered something like 80,000 feet, which is pretty nuts. Like something must have happened there. But it's 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 bottomless tall account. People people have been throwing trash in there. Is the story because it seemingly never fills up. This guy told Mel that he tossed his dead dog. <laughs> His, his dead dog, that's quite the burial, into this hole. And uh, sometime in, in the near future, he saw the dog running through the woods. He could he could identify it as his dog somehow. So this this, this supernatural hole, and I guess uh, shortly after Mel bought the property, and uh, I should say he, he publicized this on Coast to Coast with uh, Art Bell. This happened after he goes public with this story. Apparently, he goes home one day, and at the gate to his property, there's these two, you know, men in black suits. I don't know if it was two. These government agent-looking guys are telling him that he can't go on his property because of a plane crash, which apparently there's no evidence of, and, and he just was being barred from his own property. So, bottomless hole, supernatural, government is allegedly into it. One more piece of fun evidence. This was in the 90s, so there was no Google Maps, but on, on whatever government collection of satellite images that was available to the public, the area where this hole allegedly was, was blacked out, and like, like a black square over it, so you couldn't see the images. So yeah, I don't know if you could call that a hometown legend, or just something creepy in the backwoods of central Washington, but it's kind of a local, regional kind of story, so I thought... Uh, some people might get a kick out of it. Maybe come to Washington, see some, some weird stuff. We got Bigfoot out here. We got all of it. So have a good night. Hopefully this opens the eyes of some people. Thanks, Derek. A big thank you to Shane for sharing that story. This is a tale I'm pretty familiar with. I know several highly regarded podcasts that have covered this subject. Astonishing legends and blurry photos, just to name a few. But for more on this strange anomaly, we kick it over to Red Elk TV for an in-depth look at a rather large void. 
Ellensburg and its surrounding valleys and Menashtash Ridge are beautiful in any season, but some believe what lies beneath is a deep, dark hole with supernatural powers. One of the only people alive ever known to have seen this mysterious hole took me as far as he could or would. Oh, honey, don't go up that damn driveway. I want to see if there's tracks up here. I'm just curious. You're out of your tree going up there. Red Elk, a Native American shaman or medicine man, tells me his dad first showed him the hole in 1961. He says, this is an endless hole. He says he's been back many times and that strange things happen every time he goes near it. And people get it confused with what I call the devil's hole. Many locals claim to know about the hole, but it didn't really become a phenomenon until 1997, when Mel Waters went on the Coast to Coast radio show with Art Bell. I, as usual, I brought the dogs with me. Uh, they wouldn't go anywhere near the damn thing. Waters said the hole had a three-foot stone wall around it. It seemed bottomless to him, so he used an old shark fisherman's trick, sending thousands of feet of fishing line down. What I did is I sent down a roll of lifesavers. Uh, lifesavers? Yeah, so when it hits the water, the, the lifesavers will dissolve. But the lifesavers came back up whole, no water. So how deep was this hole? Waters said he believed it descended miles into the earth, and he says he's heard strange stories about its powers. The one guy claims that he threw his uh, departed canine down into the hole. He swear the dog actually came back to him. When Mel went public, that's when the trouble began. But why? Now I'm going public on this. Red Elk claims the government has a secret base there. It's an underground base, a very small underground base. That's how Red Elk explains white boxes covering the area on some satellite images. Is the government covering something up? Red Elk says he's also witnessed alien activity at the hole. A huge spacecraft, one will appear and, and hover over the hole. That, he says, happens during summer solstice. They unload and then they load, and then they take off. God help the things that they load. Alien spacecraft, dogs that come back to life? I went to the Northwest Museum of Legends and Lore seeking some answers. Well, I believe there is a hole. But Philip Lipson's never seen the hole, even though he's led expeditions to find it. Well, I think it's an actually a true, a true event, just something that's never really been totally uncovered. And to this day, no one's been able to find it since that famous radio conversation. It was mildly sensational, and then it just mushroomed, completely out of control. Allensburg Public Library historian Milton Waggy says the phone rang off the hook with all kinds of stories about the hole, some explainable, some not. He's still trying to solve the mystery of what happened to the library's file on Mel's hole. Well, it just disappeared, which lends itself to the mysteriousness of Mel's hole. You know, did Mel take it? Did it just sort of you know, rise out of the locked file cabinet? You never know. You know, there might be a hole out there. Question is, can any of us find it? Denise Whitaker, Como 4 News. Now, as if all this wasn't strange enough, I've heard of a similar hole in the state of Nevada. Apparently, they've even retrieved strange creatures from that one. But we're going to save that story for another time. Thank you again, Shane, for taking the time to share that story. Like I said, I have a lot of these stories to get through, so I'm going to waste no time in moving on to the next. And that entry takes us to eastern Pennsylvania and a mountain that's just a bit more spooky than the others. The following was submitted by James in the state of Pennsylvania. Hey, this is for the Hometown Legends episodes. This is James. I'm from eastern Pennsylvania in Bucks County, right outside Allentown. Anyway, right by my uh, house, there's a mountain. We call it Haycock Mountain, but more locally, it's known as Ghost Mountain. And it's in a lot of the Bucks County Haunted books. Anyway, a bunch of my buddies, uh, about two years ago, about 2017 summer, we thought, oh, let's drive up to Ghost Mountain because there's supposedly a house of albino cannibals and it's made out of like all glass. 
anyway, so we, we drove up there and there is actually a glass house up there. Supposedly, if you get too close to it, they chase you down. That didn't happen. But we did find a cover bridge that is apparently if you turn your car off on the bridge and turn it back on, it won't start. So we did this and our car did start. But in the time that me and my two friends who were with me, we'll call them F and B, in the four or five minutes we had the car off, the feeling that came upon us in the car Personally, I felt like I was on a roller coaster, like I was going down a, a like a large hill or something. I was getting pulled back into my chair, and I thought it was real weird. So, but I didn't want to say anything and encourage my buddies to feel the same way. So, you know, eventually we turn the car on and we leave. It's quiet. No one's saying anything. Finally, F in the back seat is like, dude. It felt like it felt like we were going down a we we're on a roller coaster. I was getting pulled into my chair. I turn to him and I go, that's super weird because I felt the same way. And it was just like no ghost or anything. Apparently, you're supposed to see like a woman in white on the bridge too. And, you know, none of that. But I just thought it was really eerie that we both felt the same thing and no one really said anything to each other. But we both felt the same way. That's my story. Really like what you're doing. Listen to like every episode. Thanks. Thank you, James. And like I just mentioned, I have a ton of these stories to get through, so some of the commentary might be a bit light. That said, over the past few days, I've been logging a lot of new submissions, and I've stumbled upon quite a few of these stories from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, or at least that general area. That must make it one of those window areas that everyone's talking about. Places where the veil between our world and that of another, more strange world, is the thinnest. Thinking of places like... Skinwalker Ranch, the Bennington Triangle, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Either that, or I'm simply applying an M. Night Shyamalan plot device to the area. After all, it is the location a majority of his films take place. Thank you again, James, for your submission. Alright, are you guys ready for a mystery? Well, Allison from upstate New York has just the thing that you need. The following is her call from the Empire State. Hi, this is Allison from New York. I had just called to share my cousin's ghost story, but I also thought it would be a good time to just share a hometown legend since I know that's coming up. So I am from New York, and this story is from Austining, New York, the Sleepy Hollow area, which is a very beautiful and spooky place if you have never been. This story is really special to me because... I've heard it from my, well, from many different sources who have no connection to each other. And although it slightly changes each time I hear it, there are very similar elements to it each time I do that I can tell come from the same legend, whatever it may be. So this is the version that I heard from my boyfriend's father who grew up in Austining. So the story goes that there was a small, lonely house on a road called Gory Brook Lane, and that a father and his young daughter lived there alone. And that it was fine. They, they had a good time together. They had a sweet relationship, and they just did their own thing in their little house in the woods. Although, it, since it was alone in the woods, they were friends with the local law enforcement who would check up with them every once in a while just to make sure they were okay since they were so secluded from the rest of town. Now, one day, the police officer comes to check on them and... He finds dinner at the table, everything fine, food hot on their plates, but the father and daughter nowhere to be seen. Not a trace of violence, not a trace of disturbance whatsoever. They have simply vanished. I have heard this story in the form of alien abduction to ogre, a mountain ogre coming down and snatching them up. There is many different culprits responsible for the disappearance of this father and daughter. However, no one can ever agree on what has caused the vanishing. I find this story so interesting because I hear it from many different accounts, like I mentioned earlier, but I can trace nothing about this story online. I find it so interesting, and I've even contacted the local historian to see if there was actual events of a father and daughter going missing at one point in the history of this town, and I can find nothing. So I don't know where this story gets its roots, but somehow many people know it. And I find it 
really creepy and truly fascinating. So I hope you do the same. Thanks, Derek. Happy Halloween. Thank you, Allison. That is indeed a strange story. It harkens back to other odd disappearances over history. Roanoke Island, Dyatlov Pass, Portlock, Alaska, and that's one we've even discussed recently. And another that's just as creepy, and dare I say, twice as mysterious. The following was read from a billboard posted outside the remnants of the Sauter family home in Fayetteville, West Virginia. The billboard reads, On Christmas Eve, 1945, our home was set afire and five of our children, ages 5 through 14, kidnapped. The officials blamed defective wiring, although lights were still burning after the fire started. The official report stated that the children died in the fire, however no bones were found in the residue, and there was no smell of burning flesh during or after the fire. What was the motive of the law officers involved? What did they have to gain by making us suffer all these years of injustice? Why did they lie and force us to accept those lies? And the billboard goes on to show five of the children's photographs. Now there's a very good BuzzFeed Unsolved video covering this very odd tragedy. I've linked to it in tonight's show notes. I highly suggest you guys go over there and take a quick look at this. I don't have time this episode to go into a deep dive on this, but trust me, if you guys are into mysteries, this is one for you. And thank you again, Allison, for taking the time to share your story. Now for our next entry, we head west to my home state of California. The following is Mark's story. Hey Derek, this is Mark out of California. I got a hometown legend in a town called Exeter. It's a small little farming community. It's uh, out there located in Tulare County actually. And there's a legend of a ghost on Barsley Road. What was told is that up in 1950, these teens tried to play a prank on the motorcyclist that would go down the road. So they tied a string on the road. So when one of them was approaching, they could lift up the string and they could hit him in the chest, you know, and then they could knock him off the bike. Well, these kids, they misjudged it. So what happened was there was a motorcycle list going down. It decapitated him. The string was too high, and the legend has it that you see this bike going up and down the road at crazy speed. They say, like, like a lightning bolt going up and down. And people have even reported going there very late at night, just passing by, and there would be an oncoming light, just like a headlight. They'll say, no matter how loud the music's playing, and everything they can still hear like the engine roar as it approaches them. So once it gets to the car, they said it passes them and disappears. But people have reported that they have seen a headless rider on there. It's not happened every time, but it's happened quite a bit of times to where there's been a very famous musician named, I think, Dave Sturgeon? I think so. He made a song called The Ghost of Barsley Road, and uh, it sold a lot of copies when it was made because of what was happening. I don't know. Maybe you could check it out. That was my hometown legend. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. There's absolutely no way I wasn't going to dig this song up. So without further ado, The Ghost of Bardley Road by Dane Sturgeon. Death had claimed this teenage kid by the time that he was found. There was no flesh and not a mark upon his body show. They say he was scared to death by the ghost of Bartley Road. On his snow white Honda, he drags the countryside. A ghost machine a burning up the road. If you put him to the test, you'll come out second best. And you know you've raised the ghost of Barzero. <laughs>
Now, I'm not sure how much of that I can legally play, so we better stop there. If you'd like to hear the entire 1967 classic, jump to tonight's show notes at monstersamonguspodcast.com and click on the show notes. Thanks again, Mark, for taking the time to share that. It's always fun when they come with a little song. Now, recently, one of our special episodes was hijacked by the Lone Star State. I believe 75% of the stories that I played originated from the state of Texas. Well, ironically enough, on this special episode, we only have one submission from the state of Texas. And get this, it's an anonymous one to boot. The following was submitted anonymously from the state of Texas. Hey, I'm a couple minutes into the uh, Hometown Legends episode and had to quick pause it and call in. Uh, Your caller from Emmaus, Pennsylvania kind of jogged my memory. He mentioned on this specific road that there was a albino family that would chase people off their land, whatnot. And I grew up 45 minutes from Emmaus in Lansdale, almost a straight shot down 309. And growing up, we also had a similar, I don't want to call it hometown legend because it wasn't tied to Lansdale, but somewhere in that area, I specifically remember as a kid and also as a teenager just driving around looking for this fabled farm where supposedly there was a, I don't want to say cult, but a, a collective or a community of albino people. I remember that, that apparently like they were protected by local government and there were these little conspiracies and I specifically remember driving around trying to find them but not knowing what town or what locality I guess yeah just kind of weird that I don't know if that's a PA thing or if it traveled down to us from Emmaus over the years but just found it kind of crazy that you know that that little bit of folklore traveled 45 minutes south on the uh, the words of children Yeah, just wanted to call and mention that. Kind of cool. Bye. Thank you, sir. Our caller makes an interesting point. Many of these stories are told, shared, and I suppose in some instances, even invented by children. Sure, adults like you and I enjoy these tales as well. But I doubt that any of us are sitting in a dark room, repeating them to one another. Well, I guess that's exactly what I'm doing, but... I feel like I might be outside the norm on this one. Either way, I love the submission. Maybe a few of these guys moved further north to Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and became those strange crawler things that we keep hearing about. Thank you again, caller, for taking the time to share that one. So our next call of the evening is very similar in theme. So I figured... Why not play these things back to back? The following is Matt's submission from the state of Pennsylvania. Hey, Derek. This is Matt Shang out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this is a story about the episode you were doing, The Hometown Legends. I grew up in a town about a few hours outside of Pittsburgh called Asheville, New York. It's a a population of about 1,200 people, so it's very small. And this has nothing to do with cryptids or paranormal, but it is a story that still terrifies me to this day. So uh, when I was when I was young, there was always tales of you know giant hairy creatures and you know black cats and UFOs and such like that. But there was always one rumor that everyone or not rumor, uh, legend, uh, that everyone kind of talked about. And it was of these deep backwoods people. They lived like completely off the grid. And there was always like tales of people being snatched up and what have you. I actually experienced one of these backwoods people that just like completely changed the way I go hiking now, especially when I go back home. So my buddy and I, this is, this is 2005. It's in the springtime. So it's pretty nice out. My buddy and I, we go night hiking and we just point in a direction and just go. 
we actually took a little tent, hiked a few miles, and then kind of just parked in the swamp area and set up the tent, went to sleep, woke up super early. It was probably like 5 a.m. Woke up my friend and was like, hey, you know, we got to go. We got lots to do. So we uh, started hiking and it was probably another maybe like five miles and we started hearing gunshots off in the distance and we look and we see a person quite a ways away so we decide to hide um, and we're looking around frantically for a place to hide and we see a fallen tree and there's a little hole underneath it so we both dive into there and this guy gets to the area and he's like searching the area and now we're miles miles and miles and miles from any house and this guy i remember he had was balding had like long scraggly hair long unkept beard and like a weird hair lip or maybe he was just like lifting his lip up but um we must uh we must he searched around was kind of like grumbling to himself i thought he might have been drunk but I, I don't know that because he was just kind of like grumbling to himself and stumbling around. And so we waited about a, a half an hour after he left until we went and just ran until we couldn't anymore. So those legends, that, that legend in my hometown, those stories were a reality. And, you know, it's nothing, it's nothing paranormal or anything, you know, like I said, but like it, it, it's, still terrifying and uh yeah that's about it i really can't point out the exact area because we kind of just blindly chose but um yeah i love your show keep up the good work and take care thanks matt humans are far scarier than any monster well said the guy that's never seen a monster but i feel for you matt not only was the man's presence alarming, but he was also armed as well, and possibly intoxicated. Now this experience immediately reminded me of one of my favorite horror films from the early 2000s. Wrong Turn, starring Elijah Dushku, Jeremy Sisto, and Emmanuel Shrieky. One of the villains of this film actually even had a cleft lip as well. So give that flick a watch if you're bored one evening. I'm actually curious to see if it still holds up. Either way, thank you again, Matt, for sharing that call. Now, before we move on to our next call of the evening, I want to remind everyone that if you have a story to share, you can simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Or visit the website at monstersamonguspodcast.com and click on the Report Your Sightings tab for more submission options. Now for our next hometown legend, we won't be traveling too far from Matt's experience. The following is Joel's submission from my home state of Ohio. Hey, I'm Joel from Bowling Green, Ohio. I heard you're from, or went to school from Northwest Ohio, and uh, that's kind of tight. And uh, I used to read the Haunted Ohio books a lot when I was in elementary. I just want to say thank you for your podcast because you give people like me a spot to feel like we're not crazy. We've seen what we saw, you know, so getting that out the way. So around here, I guess it's a hometown legend, is that Holcomb Woods or Holcomb Road. Some people get the two the same way because it's, it's a road that goes through the woods legendarily. There was a bus that crashed and had a bus full of kids and they said they haunt the woods. And my senior year, 2009, a lot of people that I knew we were friends, but they used to go out there and just get drunk and get high and just try to scare the girls that they were with. You know, this was, like I said, senior year in high school. That's what you do, you know, like, let's hang out with chicks and scare them and just show them how manly I am but like you know I'll get out the truck and you know be out here in the woods you know so like that was the thing to do I know you mentioned the haunted Ohio books 
because I know in the back there was a uh, like an index with the uh, counties, and they had Wood County, and that's where I was from. And it said Holcomb Road, and it said something about you have to point your car towards Route 6 or one of the highway type things. Honk your horn twice, flash your brights, and then you'll see the bus. Well, about the bus crashing and stuff. It was me, my best friend, and our girlfriend. My friend's girlfriend, Mom, drove us, and she pointed the car towards the highway, honked the horn twice, flickered the lights, and what we saw was a red light on the other side of the woods. I didn't think nothing of it because I thought that's a, a radio station. Uh, you know, you see that everywhere. You know, just the red light blinking. And so we, th- we saw that. I didn't think nothing of it. And then it got bright. Bright, man. I'm telling you, like, I couldn't even look at it no more. Like, it was just too bright. But everybody kept looking at it because it got brighter and brighter and brighter. And eventually, it turned into a spotlight. The spotlight was scary. To me, it was scary. They kept looking, but I looked away from it because as macho as I want to look, nah, I'm not about to look at the Well... They kept tapping me, like, look, 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 look. So I was like, oh, okay. I looked at it. It turned into one big-ass bright light into two lights. So it looked like headlights on a bus. And you can hear it. You can hear a bus catching steam. Like, ooh, ooh. Like, like it was shifting gears and stuff like that. And it was going faster and faster. And like I said, I was scared. So I didn't want to look at it no more. So I turned my head inside the car and I looked down. Well, this light was so bright. It illuminated the whole car. So I looked down and I could still see like everything in the car. I could see my feet in the car. And I'm telling you, it's pitch black in the forest. Like where we're at in the Holcomb Woods, it's so dark. You cannot see nothing. Like you can't see nothing. I tried not to look at it, but it's so bright. You can't escape it. I looked up. You can see in the side view mirror, the rear view mirror, and the far side mirror. So it's like, this thing might kill me. I might as well just look at it. So I look back at it, and then all you hear is a screeching, hear a crash. But the light, the light turns into the woods, and you can see the trees waving back and forth from the wind. Thank you, Joel. As it turns out, you're incredibly close to my alma mater, basically on top of it, I would say. I spent five years in good old Bowling Green, and actually visited Holcomb Road on more than one occasion. I actually probably have some home video of our adventures around here somewhere, but this happened probably 20 years ago, so this is all going to be on digital tape somewhere. I never had the experience that Joel did, but not for the lack of effort. I know I've taken several groups out there, probably at least a dozen visits, and we never saw the light. But I did manage to find a short video of another group of kids investigating that area. And oddly enough, the same light that Joel describes also shows up in this video. As usual, hit up the show notes to see it. And thank you again, Joel. I've been meaning to make my way back to campus one of these days. Oh, and if you're ever in Bowling Green, be sure to get some... uh, Chicken and cheese breadsticks from Polly Eyes. Trust me on that one. So our next entry of the evening takes us back to the state of California. The following is Noah's submission. Hi Derek, this is Noah calling from Los Angeles, California. Hopefully uh, this voicemail makes it in time for the Hometown Legends episode. So I got a quick one for you. Uh, about 20 miles or so north of Los Angeles is Oxnard, California. Now, in Oxnard, California, there's Cal State Channel Islands, which is well known to be haunted uh, to locals. It actually used to be a mental hospital for uh, the heavily disabled, but that's not what I'm calling it about. Just down the street from Cal State uh, Channel Islands is a place known locally as Scary Dairy. It used to be a old dairy farm. Now it's notorious for hauntings, uh, satanic rituals, 
and just a bunch of murders. There's reportedly six bodies that have been found there. And it is uh, kind of an unwritten rule that you do not go to this place once the sun goes down because the risk of running across cult members or gang members is increases significantly. So I've been to the location a few times myself. It's kind of a recreation area, so there's some hiking trails there. And uh, the main structure with the main dairy farm structure, which is fenced off, but there's tons of little holes in the fence for people to go into. Very popular spot for college kids. So the place is all graffitied up. The building itself is super worn down. The actual structure has a very strange layout and overall vibe to it. Anyways, every time I go there, I see runes, freshly spray-painted runes every time I've gone there facing north, south, east, and west. And there would usually be a circle in the middle of the room. And accompanying that circle probably happened like four out of the six times I've been there. I've always seen fresh bird carcasses. Uh, one time I've seen a decapitated chicken. So it just kind of adds validity to the local legend. And now that whole area, Scary Dairy and Cal State Channel Island, just has an overall super creepy vibe to it. The air is very thick, even more so in Scary Dairy proper. So that's my hometown legend. Hope you can use it. Love the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Noah. Late last spring, Sarah and I were hiking around a local area. An area that actually has a mirrored men sighting stemming from it. The place is called Strawberry Peak, and it now houses a fire lookout and cell phone towers. And believe it or not, a camouflaged bunker from World War II that overlooks the former Norton Air Force Base. And apparently acted as a backup command center and air traffic control should the Japanese attack during World War II. Anyway, back to the point. Far from the road, we found several circles made of wood and rocks, almost resembling a bullseye. And there in the center, among some burned paper and wood, was the rotting carcass of a chicken, complete with feathers and a head. I don't know what the nature of the ritual performed was, but I will admit that even I was a little freaked out. At no point did I think that Sarah and I were in any danger, but I didn't care for the unnecessary end to that poor chicken. Now, as for Noah's story, I need to make my way to Channel Islands. I don't know much about the area, but Sarah and I are huge National Park fans, so it's an almost must-see for us, especially given its close proximity to where we live. Thank you again, Noah, for sharing that call. And speaking of Instagram... You guys should probably go ahead and follow the show on all of our social media accounts, including our very exclusive and very active Facebook group. Addie, Warren, Tony, John, and Sarah run a tight ship over there, but I know they'd welcome you aboard. So our next creepy legend of the evening takes us to the state of Illinois. The following is Zelda Submission. Hi there, my name is Zelda, and I'm a fairly new listener and working my way backwards. I'm probably on early season five now, so I'm not sure if you covered this. But um, in some of the episodes, you talk about hometown legends, and I'm sure I'm too late to get put on the hometown legends um, if this isn't already covered. But I figured I'd call and share. I live in Chicago, but I grew up in a small, like ruralish town uh, about a half hour outside of Milwaukee called New Berlin, but it's next to a town called Muskego. And there is a popular legend for the town of Muskego called Haunchyville. And so there is this town called Haunchyville, and the legend has it that off of Mystic Road or off a dirt road that goes, that like is perpendicular to Mystic Road, there's a, like a giant, like an albino giant, or he's just a very tall man. But he stands there on guard with a shotgun, and he is the protector of a settlement of liberated circus dwarves, or just like, you know, the circus people who live there, and they live in miniature houses and have miniature animals. And so that was the story. I never went, um, even though it's thought to be a hoax now, um, it very well could have been a temporary space for people at one time or not, and especially with the Wisconsin's like history of the circus 
and stuff like that. So Wisconsin is like a portal of weirdness, so I wouldn't put anything past possibility. But thank you for doing the podcast. Much appreciated. Bye. Thank you, Zelda. Now there's a story. Circus folks hiding out. I can certainly see how they could start all sorts of rumors. Possibly a couple horror films as well. But this story reminds me of a darker chapter in circus history. A chapter from the nearby state of Indiana. The Hammond Circus Train Disaster. They have slept here for 100 years. Some were known only by nickname. Baldy, Four Horse Driver, but most of the grave markers here are labeled unknown male or unknown female. Each has a number. This is Showman's Rest, where a mass burial plot contains the remains of 56 performers and roustabouts of the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus. Their circus train had come to a stop on these tracks in Hammond. Most of the train had switched to a different track, but four sleeper cars sat on the main line. It was June 22nd, 1918, about 4 a.m., everyone was asleep, when an empty troop train came barreling at them from behind, upwards of 30 miles an hour. Its engineer had fallen asleep at the throttle. When the troop train engine hit, it destroyed the caboose totally. They never found the guy that was in the caboose. It was just destroyed and the, the troop train just kept going on and on and on. The crash was so loud a neighbor said he thought the steel mills had blown up. Those who weren't killed on impact were buried in the debris of cars made entirely of wood. It became an inferno. The kerosene lamps that used to light the coaches is spread over the lumber and started the fire. A lot of people were trapped, they couldn't get out, uh, they just burned it out. 86 souls perished, a circus strong man, a clown's wife and sons among them. The engineer of the troop train was charged with manslaughter, but after a mistrial, those charges were dropped. He had missed signals and flares telling him to stop. You're helpless, what could they do? They, they tried to signal the, the oncoming train and there was no response, and there wasn't even a slowdown. The Hagenbeck Wallace Circus train wreck remains one of the worst rail disasters in U.S. history. The late Warren Reeder was a five-year-old Hammond boy back in 1918, eager, like so many others, to see the circus. Half a century later, he provided a window to history with his book, No Performances Today, which has just been reprinted by the Hammond Historical Society. This is sacred ground. Shortly before the tragedy, the Showman's League of America bought a tract of land at Woodlawn Cemetery. Little did its members know that the first burials would be en masse. The League recently unveiled this new marker dedicated to the unnamed, the unclaimed, the unrecognizable. Remarkably, three days after so many died a century ago, the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus, with borrowed acts from other circuses, put on a performance in Beloit. What do they miss, two performances? Yeah, two performances is all they miss because others, we, we work with our own, we, we stay together. So they help them because the show must go on. No animals died in the wreck, but showman's rest will always be marked by its elephant statues, their trunks lowered forever in mourning for those who died 100 years ago. Paul Meinke, ABC7 Eyewitness News. That clip comes courtesy of ABC News 7 out of Chicago. And thank you again, Zelda, for taking the time to share. Well, I suppose now is as good a time as any to make this announcement. I received enough hometown legend submissions to warrant a three-part series. So the second will drop here next week. But the third installment can be found exclusively on Patreon. Now, if you're not a supporter, you have plenty of time to head over to patreon.com and search for Monsters Among Us podcast and join up. And I decided to do something a little different to make this easier for everyone to get their hands on. Typically, the bonus episodes are reserved for the $4 level. But I'm going to go ahead and make this one available to all levels, including the $1 a month pledge. So head on over to Patreon and get yourself set up and be ready for that to drop in about a week and a half. So our next hometown legend takes us east to the state of Virginia. The following is Katie's submission. 
Hi, Derek. It's me, Katie. I got a story for you. This story kind of got to me because, actually, I think it's going to probably help you out with your hometown legend. And this takes me back to where I grew up, back in Maryland. I grew up in a small town called Mount Airy between the Route 70, between Frederick and Baltimore, probably 45 minutes from Baltimore and 35 minutes from Frederick. Well, there was a long back road that me and my friends that I used to go to college with and that I grew up, grew up with for a long time. And we always used to take this back road. Well, what I didn't know the story about it was is that there was a slave cemetery. A couple nights afterwards, I was joking around with some friends, and they were telling me about this road, and they were telling me about a slave cemetery. Well, come to find out that two of my friends drove down there, splurging out racial innuendos and all that stuff, and all of a sudden, they heard a crowd of people seeming like they were running towards their car. Well, apparently they got freaked out and they left. Me being a skeptic, well, at that time I was. I I knew that there was something paranormal, but I didn't want to believe it. But when I went there, I definitely was a believer. Do you think my witch's pawn experience was crazy? This one's even crazier. I actually did a lot of research on it. Actually found out all the graves sites and everything, went on the internet, investigated it, picked out a name, found the grave, went back with a bunch of friends, we were in the truck, and it was probably like a crisp fall evening. No wind, nothing. Just a dead, cool, crisp fall evening. Mind you, we're down there, probably 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, something like that. But we get there. And I find the gravestone, and I start saying this person's name. And you can physically feel how cold it is towards the grave instead of the regular temperature. And my friend was just like, this is crap. Like, this is crap. Like, this isn't real. I told her to stick her hand towards the grave, and it was colder than what it was around the grave. And then my friend... Ben saw a pair of red eyes peek from the tree. And obviously we ran, got in the truck and left. To be honest with you, I really think that there's something paranormal there. It's been around since like the early 1800s. And I really feel like maybe one day I'll have the courage to go back. But for right now, where I'm living in Southern Virginia, I'd rather stay here and <laughs> find out more paranormal experiences while I'm, in Virgi- while I'm living in Virginia now. But I really appreciate your podcast, and I really hope that this makes the final season of your new season for home- for hometowns and everything, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. I believe many rural areas have spooky places with very racist names. I know our area growing up had one as well. Although I will admit it was very little known even when I was in high school. Unfortunately, the area I'm talking about became known as something else when during my senior year of high school, two acquaintances of mine were killed while visiting this local spot. Apparently, they climbed to the top of an oil storage tank with lit cigarettes in their hands. The rumor was you could hear the explosion from miles away. People really seemed to steer clear after that. Not that the place was all that inviting before, but with the recent tragedy, I think it was simply too much for most people to handle. But on a brighter note, thank you again, Katie, for taking the time to share that submission. Now our next entry comes to us from a very familiar voice, at least if you're a fan of the television show Paranormal Caught on Camera. A few weeks ago, I sat down with Sapphire Sandalo of Paranormal Caught on Camera and host of the brand new Paranormal Podcast, Stories with Sapphire. Well, she returned the favor by submitting a story about her ancestral home. The following is Sapphire's Call from the state of California. 
Hey everyone, my name is Sapphire Sindalo, and I am the creator and host of a new podcast called Stories with Sapphire. So I wanted to share an experience that my grandfather shared with me um, back when I was around 10 years old. Uh, this is a story that has always stuck with me, um, partly because it was the first really fantastical story that my grandfather told me and it's the one that set me on this journey of becoming really obsessed with learning about mythology and the paranormal. So my grandfather lived in the Philippines and when he was probably in his early 20s he was working as a civil engineer and so he was working on a project really late one night and was about to walk home around like 2 a.m. So he's walking down the path that he usually takes and the only light that's provided for him is from the full moon above. And as he's walking, he passes this yard that has a dog and every other night that he would walk by, this dog would always bark at him. But for some reason, this night, the dog just sat there quietly and stared at him as he walked past. And it was at that moment that my grandfather heard this really high-pitched sound echoing around him. Um, I'll try to make it right now, but it was sort of like a tiki, tiki kind of sound. <laughs> um, yeah, that's sort of what it sounded like. And so it didn't sound like a bird that he'd ever heard of, um, didn't sound like a human, and it really freaked him out. So he whipped out his pocket knife as he continued to walk. And he's still walking and he sees this shack where a security guard is. And that's when he hears the sound again and it freaks him out. So he walks over to the shack and he goes inside and just stays there with the security guard for a little bit. Um, they don't say a word to each other, but he can tell that the security guard also hears the sound and is terrified of it. So he waits there until the sound gets further and further away. And so he thinks that he's, you know, it's safe to leave now. So he leaves the little shack and he continues on his way home. And the entire way home, he's praying to himself, holding his knife in his hand. And the sound, that high pitched sound gets further and further away. So the next day when he goes back to work, he tells his coworkers about what he heard and they are all in shock. They can't believe that my grandfather is, you know, still standing there. And they tell him that what he heard was a tiqui. Basically, it's this woman who has the ability to separate her upper body at the torso and leaves her legs on the ground. And then when she goes flying around at night, um, looking for humans to eat and blood to drink, she makes this really high pitched sound. And these monsters are actually really good tricksters because the softer that the sound is the closer that they are so my grandpa actually got really lucky that night and after that he never walked home alone again so for those of you who might be familiar with filipino mythology uh this is actually also called a mananangal but tikwi was what they called it in the region that my grandfather lived so yeah that's one of my favorite stories that my grandpa told me. Uh, it gave me chills the first time I heard it. And the thing about these stories when they're shared in my family, um, for the most part, everybody sees it as truth. These creatures and the spirit world, these are all very real things to my family. And that's in my opinion, what makes the Filipino culture so great. Um, you know, even people who may not necessarily believe in the paranormal, these stories are just so much part of our culture. Um, and that's part of what I want to share in my new podcast, um, sharing these stories that our family passes down. And I'm sure most of you listening also have stories that, you know, your grandfather or great great grandfathers have shared with you. And if you do have a story um, and you want me to share it on my podcast, please send me an email at storieswithsapphire at gmail.com. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sapphire. I don't know exactly when my interview with her drops, but follow the show and watch our social media account for updates on that. And I think it goes without saying, 
If you have a story that you think fits perfectly for stories with Sapphire, make Monsters Among Us look good. Shoot her a message. As for Sapphire's story, I admittedly know very little about the paranormal in other regions, at least in comparison to the supernatural goings-on in North America. So I always get a kick out of these stories. And strangely enough, of the few international monsters I am hip to, the Mana Nagal is actually one of them. If you remember, we actually covered that creature way back in Season 1 or possibly early Season 2. So hopefully in future installments, we receive more stories from abroad. I think I enjoy hearing them as much as you guys do. And a big thank you again to Sapphire for not only the submission, but for taking the time to talk spooky with me as well. I can't wait to hear the episode. And on that note, we're going to cap this thing off for the night. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Addie Lloyd. All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And that bone-chilling music you're hearing, let's co.ag. Thank you so much for listening, and until next week. Tonight's bonus story is actually a bonus call. The following submission was sent in by KC in the state of California. Hey Derek, this is KC from Ontario, California. Calling you with a candidate for a future Hometown Legends episode if you decide to have any more. I got uh, busy trying to get caught up on your shows and before I knew it, season 7 finale had passed. So hopefully this is... uh, one for a future episode for you. Now, it doesn't have a lot of history or lore behind it, but I think it's a good example of how legends can get a start and also how they morph a little bit. So here we go. Now, I was born and partially raised in a uh, small farming community in the center of Utah. It was an older town being founded in the mid-1800s, as I recall, and... Because it was a farming community, it was very common to have a barn or two on your property, and you know, a lot of them you know, even had livestock on them. The house I grew up on was on the corner, a block away from the main road, and at the beginning of our street, you know, on the corner of the main road in our street, was a two-story brick home that was often referred to as the Pink Mansion even though it didn't look very pink to me. Um, the property, like all the others in town, did have a barn, but unlike the aged, you know, dilapidated wood that all the other barns were made out of, this one was made out of the same color of brick as the, uh, the main home. So because of this, it wasn't as big as your, you know, your typical barn, but it was still you know, at least two stories tall, and it was you know, wide and had similar features to a barn. But it was parked close enough to the house that it was used as a garage when I was you know, a young kid. And it was this barn that uh, this local hometown legend happens to be about. Now, the barn was on the property line, uh, and it bordered the next property down the street, and that lot happened to be vacant. And on that back side of the barn that overlooked that vacant lot, there was an opening up near the rafters, you know, square, window-shaped. But I don't recall a window pane ever being in the window as um, bats would always fly out of, of the uh, that opening on summer evenings. So it kind of added to the, uh, the spookiness of the barn, I suppose. 
Now, up until I was about five or six, an elderly couple lived in the house, and I don't remember a whole lot about them. I just remember the old lady was nice and would always wave whenever we'd pass by, but the old man passed away, and the rumor was, or as I recall, the rumor was that he had passed away in the garage, and it was um, somehow a you know a bloody or violent death. And after he moved, or I'm sorry, after he passed away, the old lady they moved away, leaving the house vacant. And so it's this barn that uh, the, the local legend is about, because the man supposedly was haunting the the barn, and on particular days, I mean, I don't remember the requirements, but you're supposed to be able to see the spirit of the old man looking out that, you know, window from the barn, you know, that overlooked that vacant lot. Now, I had a couple of friends that claimed that they saw him, but, you know, I was four houses down, and, you know, we used to play in that vacant lot a lot, and I don't recall ever seeing, you know, the the spirit or, you know, whoever supposedly, you know, lived there, and I think one of the rumors was is that it wasn't even the old man so much as, you know, uh, the bastard child of the old man and the lady that were um, that was shacked up in the garage. But, um, like I said, I did, never did see anything. And a, a game had actually developed with the friends that I hung out with where we would stand out on the sidewalk, you know, that went past the house and the barn, and we would dare one of our group to go up to the door of the barn, you know, and rattle it, you know, with the attempt to wake up the old spirit or whatever might be living inside the barn. So what would happen is the person that got selected would slowly approach the door, and just as they would reach out to rattle the, the door or the chain that was, you know, locking it, everybody else had stayed behind would suddenly start screaming and shouting, and so the person that was rattling the door would be scared and, you know, take off running and everybody else would start screaming and laughing and take off running and I don't recall that anybody ever stayed behind to uh, to see if the ghost or whatever happened to be living in the garage, you know, would come out after us. However, when I was about eight or nine, just uh, not too long before we moved away from the, the area, we had a couple of cousins staying with us and... We told them about the story, so, of course, they wanted to see what it was about. So three of us ended up going up to the barn doors. You know, of course, it's, you know, the middle of a summer afternoon, so no need to be too scared. And we we peeked in through the the barn door to to see what we could find. You know, we we were expecting, you know, blood on the, the floor of the garage or barn or whatever it was or on the walls or... You know, or you know, dead bodies hanging from the rafters. You know, all, all kinds of things were running through our minds from all the legends and things that we'd heard about that barn. But um, we got pretty disappointed when all we could see, you know, through the little bit of light that was, you know, sneaking in through the crack in the door, was a uh, an old wood bench that was pushed up against the uh, the wall, and uh, you know, I think it was littered with the old papers and wrappers, and you know, I think some aluminum cans or canisters and old coffee, you know, cans, you know, full of screws or something like that. But, no, so we we never did see anything and got pretty disappointed. But um, although we moved away, when my parents retired, they moved back to the general area. And so I had a couple of times to go visit and always drive by and drive and or one time I drove by a number of years ago, I noticed that the barn had actually been removed. And, you know, I kind of brought uh, brought this whole memory of the uh, the legend back to my mind again. And we, I had a nephew that had spent a couple of summers with my, my grandparents, or my, I'm sorry, my parents, his grandparents, but um, he had heard, you know, rumors about that same house. And here I was thinking it was just kind of a local legend you know, that my sisters or somebody had drummed up to keep kids out of the uh, the barn, but he had heard the rumor from the kids, you know, he'd go, you know, snowboarding with that uh, the man had actually killed a maid in the house. And then at some point in time after that, I'd heard from somebody else in the, the area that the rumor was that a body had been found in the walls of the house. So, you know, we had three different rumors about the same house, all of them kind of, you know, violent and gruesome. None of them probably true, 
but I just I found it kind of interesting because I don't know you know when each version of the story kicked up, but you know with that garage being the place or the barn being the place of the initial rumor or legend, and then that gets tore down, so then the legend kind of shifts to the house. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I've tried researching a little bit about it, but um, I don't know. I can never find anything even referencing the Pink Mansion, let alone a, a death in the Pink Mansion. But I thought it would be worth sharing because, like I said, it's, it has stood the test of time a little bit. Although it, you know the legend started even when I was a little kid. But um, hopefully, it's something you uh, you feel that you can use on your show. If not, hopefully, you at least enjoy listening to it. And uh, good luck with your show. Thanks. Thank you, Casey. I'm going to make a claim that's likely to be unpopular, but it's also likely to be very accurate. I can't help but feel that some of these places are only given a story, a fictional one at that, based on their appearance. This is what I mean. Would a place like the Pink Mansion be known, or even have a spooky story about it, if it weren't pink? Did some people simply see a rotting pink building and assign a story to it? Oh, that place is strange. Something weird must have happened there. Now, I'm not trying to sway anyone's opinion here. After all, this is merely a guess that I'm making. But it could help explain why every odd-colored and strange-shaped building in this country seems to have some sort of strange or spooky backstory. Then again, maybe it's best to just leave it as a scary legend. Perhaps it's more fun to keep us all guessing. Thank you again, Casey, for taking the time to share that story. And thank you for sticking around to the end of the show. Have a good night.